Let me set the scene for you. You're a kid in the 90s. You got your first Pokemon game. It's probably red. I mean, because nobody chose blue. I mean, I chose blue, but to be fair, I got blue because I traded away my copy of Luigi's Mansion to some kid because he wanted it and I wanted Pokemon blue. So I made some life decisions there now, didn't I? That wasn't my first Pokemon game, though. Pokemon Ruby was, if anybody was curious. But anyways, my point is you're playing a Pokemon game and you get to Rock Tunnel and it's pitch black in here. You cannot see anything. What do you do? You're probably a dumb kid. You go through with it anyways because even though you can't see anything, I mean, what are you gonna do? Backtrack? You don't, you don't wanna go back there. You wanna go forward. But as you continue to make bad life choices, you wonder, is there another way? Was there something else I could have done? I mean, well, of course there was something else you could have done. Like, why would they put it there if you couldn't? It's a video game, not real life. And that thing you could have done was using the HM move. These things. What was once one of the most common things of every Pokemon game is now a relic of the past. So join me as today we're going on a journey and we're looking at every single HM move in every Pokemon game. Well, every Pokemon game that has HM moves. As you know, starting from Gen 7, HM moves stopped existing. HM moves got replaced with Pokemon. But like actual Pokemon that you ride and not like Pokemon you use to use the HM moves. Look, if I think about this too much, it's gonna hurt my head. So let's just leave it at that. We're gonna go through gens one through six and we're gonna talk about HM moves, what they did, and how they were changed throughout generations. Since some HMs lurk kind of similarly to how they worked in the previous generations, I'm only gonna be talking about an HM again if it got changes in that generation. So we're not talking about some redundant facts about it. Well, it's time for me to play Gen 1 again. Oh boy, let's get out. It, shall we? If I told you to make a game about capturing monsters, what would be an incentive for players to capture said monsters? There's a variety of answers to this one question. You might just say, oh, I just give this monster really high stats, so you'd be encouraged to use it in battle because it wins a lot of battles. You might say one of your incentives for using one of your monsters is the aesthetic alone. After all, you might say people are more willing to pick a monster because, oh, it kind of looks cool, or oh, it kind of looks cute. Both these answers are good answers, but there's one answer we haven't talked about that Game Freak decided to go with above these two, and that's for resting through the game. Because no matter how your monster looks or how it does in battle, you're always going to want to catch something that will progress as you the game. This was one of the major things that early Pokemon was built upon. If it wasn't, then you could use any Pokemon to use Cut to get into the third gym, or any Pokemon would be able to learn Surf, or you could just ride them wherever. You don't have to worry about catching a water type Pokemon. Yeah, I know, non water type Pokemon can learn Surf, but you get the idea. So, what were the hidden moves that you could learn in Gen 1? Well, in this generation, there's only five of them. These five are the most iconic HMs of all time. And they appear in every game that has HMs. Well, I guess only really four of them are iconic because the fifth one will get dropped eventually, but we'll talk about that when it gets dropped. Those five HMs are HM1 Cut, HM2 Fly, HM3 Surf, HM4 Strength, and HM5 Flash. Each HM interacts with the game in a different way. Cut will cut down trees. Fly will let you fly back to any town or city you've already been to before. Surf will let you cross bodies of water, no matter what body of water it is. Strike will allow you to push around these boulders with relative ease. And Flash will lighten up the darkest of areas which you normally couldn't see anything in. So to use an HM move, you actually have to teach it to a Pokemon. But before you teach it to a Pokemon, you have to find the HM for it. And before you find an HM, you're going to have to have the correct gym badge to use it outside of battle. That last one's important, because without that gym badge restriction, you can easily get an HM as soon as you have access to training. All it takes is somebody who has a save file that's way farther than yours, which has every HM, them teaching it to any of their Pokemon that they can just trade over for you for the hell of it, and then with one link hail, you're one trade away from getting an HM at the very beginning of the game. God, I can only imagine a world without that restriction. I bet the speedruns in that world would be really weird. Alright, let's say you have the right gym badges and you have the right HM move and you talk to a Pokemon. Now what? Well, you gotta go on the Pokemon menu. You gotta interact with the Pokemon that has the HM move. Once you select the Pokemon that has the HM you want to use, you have to scroll through a little menu there to find the HM you want to use out of that and then select it from there. Once you do that, congratulations, you choose an HM move. You have to do that for every HM move in the game, which can get really obnoxious real fast. For Flash and Fly, which you don't use super often, it's not that big of a deal. But for Cut, Surf, and Strength, it gets real obnoxious real fast because you have to use those moves 
happens pretty often. Especially strength, because every time you go to a different floor in an area, strength will automatically turn itself off, and you have to manually turn it back on just to use it again. This doesn't sound like a big deal, but Gen 1 has its fair share of strength puzzles where you have to push a boulder to a different floor, and you can already see where this tedium would come into play. Also, another annoyance about HM moves, especially in Generation 1, is that when they're taught to a Pokemon, you can never delete them. This is pretty obnoxious because most HM moves are pretty bad to use in battle. The only real exception to this rule is Surf. Strength and Fly can be kind of good in battle, especially Fly because for a turn you're invincible, but Surf is easily the most powerful HM move to use in battle. Some other notable things about HMs in Generation 1 is that you can't leave an HM user in the daycare. In theory, I think I understand what they're trying to do here. They don't want you to be in a spot where you have to own money to get your Pokemon back to progress with the game. To a degree, I can understand why Game Freak would put a fail safe like this in the game just in case something like this could happen, but honestly, I doubt someone's gonna soft lock themselves with this. And even if they couldn't withdraw the Pokemon from the daycare, it's not hard to leave this route. If you go south, you'll just go to Beryllian City, and from there you can probably catch another Pokemon that can replace said Pokemon trapped in the daycare. The last other notable thing about Gym 1's HMs is that Cut can be used outside of battle on grass. It's really tedious, but if you're on a route that has a lot of tall grass and you don't have any repels on you, I guess that's a nice way to avoid random encounters. Also, the grass respawns very easily. I'm not even talking about just like leaving the route here. I mean, just getting into a trainer battle will reset all of that grass. I don't think it's remotely worth it, but it is something you use the cut HM for, so I might as well mention it. And that's every notable thing about the HMs and Generation 1. They're really annoying and tedious to use in Generation 1. It does not help that if you're teaching a Pokemon that you mainly want to use in your party and HM move, you're basically giving up a slot in your move set just for some really weak move. I say all this so in theory, the HM stuff is really cool. The fact that you're catching Pokemon that are helping you get around the world is really nice. It just sucks that there's a lot of tedium within it. So let's check out Gen 2 and see how they solved a lot of these issues that Gen 1 had. Generation 2 would introduce two new HM moves now. Those two HM moves being Whirlpool and Waterfall. And honestly, from this point onward, Waterfall is also a staple HM move. Waterfall is in every game that has HMs from this point on. These two moves don't do anything really that special. Whirlpool let you get rid of Whirlpools that you can see while you're surfing on the sea. You don't really use this HM too often. As a matter of fact, there's only really a handful of spots in the whole game where you really use it, if at all. And honestly, it's just there to get into Whirl Island. Waterfall lets you climb waterfalls. That's really it. So now that we've talked about the two new HMs, I want to actually talk about the new quality of life that Gen 2 has over Gen 1. For starters, you don't have to go into your menu every time you want to use Cut, Strength, or Surf. Now, if you want to use those three HMs, you just have to interact with something related to them, and you can just start using it right away. And obviously, this applies to the two new HMs, Waterfall and Whirlpool as well. You don't need to go into your menu to get rid of a Whirlpool or to go up a Waterfall. Another new thing is that you can actually delete HM moves now. It's a little bit out of the way because you have to go talk to somebody to get rid of it. It's still very inconvenient, but it's better than having the HM move be stuck on that Pokemon forever because you can't delete it normally. Also, that weird thing with Gen 1 where you couldn't put an HM Pokemon in the daycare is all another thing anymore. In fact, if you put a Pokemon with an HM in the daycare and you breed it with another Pokemon, there's a chance that the offspring will learn the parent's HM when it hatches out of the egg. This is like a really redundant thing because HMs can be used indefinitely, but hey, it's a new thing they added, I guess. And that's the only Pokemon breeding related thing I'm gonna be talking about until the future where I make a 20 minute long video about Pokemon breeding mechanics because you know what's gonna happen. Just like in Generation 1, you can also cut down tall grass with the cut HM, but now there's even tall grass and that requires you to cut it twice. I feel like that was the most niche grass cutting knowledge I learned while making this video. Gen 2 only really just added two more HMs and a lot of quality of life. Also, those two new HMs that Gen 2 added don't really get that much use, but it's a step in the right direction. It doesn't really need to add much, it just needs to add some quality of life, which was desperately needed. Now, I'm worth to Gen 3. 
Generation 3, just like Generation 2 before it, adds two more HM moves. Those HM moves being Rock Smash and Dive. Whirlpool is no longer an HM in this generation. Matter of fact, this is the first generation to go out of its way to remove and replace an HM from the previous generation with a new HM entirely. In retrospect, it's kind of funny they got rid of Whirlpool because Generation 3 has a region that's filled with water. I feel like Whirlpool actually might have got more use here than in Johto, but hey, that's just my thoughts. It makes sense though because we already have three water HMs, having a fourth one would be kind of ridiculous. But I'm not talking about Whirlpool, let's actually talk about the two new HMs that Gen 3 added. Rock Smash is a new HM, and you might think it's not because it was a Gen 2, but it was only a Gen 2 as a TM. Now it's a full on HM, which means it's required to beat the game. Which is funny I say that because actually Cut is an HM still, and it's not required to beat the game anymore, it's just kind of there for the hell of it. Cut and Rock Smash are kind of similar because they basically do the same thing. While Cut is destroying a tree that's in front of you, Rock Smash is destroying a rock that's in front of you. Well, actually, Rock Smash does have one unique property, and that is if you use Rock Smash to destroy a rock, there's a chance that a Pokemon might appear afterwards. This is the only way to get a Nose Pass, and I've never gotten Nose Pass this way. I've always had to trade him in from Pokemon XD. Nose Pass just never responds for me. I don't believe he's real. He's just a myth. The new Water HM this time around is Dive. To use Dive, you have to interact with these dark spots of water, and from there, you can actually go underwater. Honestly, this is probably my favorite HM so far. Dive makes all the ocean routes in Hoenn feel so cool because there's always another area under them. It kind of gives you similar vibes to playing Links to the Past, where you go to a dark world version of that area, and it's a completely new area within that area. The Dive HM puts you in a similar mindset where you wonder what the underwater version of the area is going to look like. Look, I'll admit, it's not as grand as Link to the Past's dark world. As a matter of fact, it's not as detailed either. Because I'll be honest with you, most of these underwater areas look kind of samey. But the fact is, you've never been able to explore a Pokemon game like this before. It felt like that every water route that had Dive had a little secret route that was hidden right under it. You're always curious wondering what could be under there. Are there wild Pokemon under there? Are there items for you to find? Or are there secret pathways that'll lead me to other routes that I normally can't get to unless I dive under them? And while I know Suopolis is a required place you need to go to in the game, it feels really cool to get there by diving because you'll see it on the map and you'll wonder how you get there and you realize oh wait I gotta go under. I can ramble for hours why I think dive is probably one of the best HMs in the game but honestly if they're gonna replace a whirlpool with anything dive was a perfect replacement. That's all I have to say about the new HM, so let's just quickly look at the Kanto remakes. Fire Red and Leak Green don't add or change any HMs, they work exactly the same as they do in the Hoenn games. The only real difference here is that there's no dive HM because there's nowhere to dive with your water in Kanto. If we're going to be looking for the slightest amount of changes to any HM this generation, we're going to have to look in Emerald for that. Pokemon in Emerald made it so Pokemon abilities actually can have an effect outside of battle. One of those being that Hyper Cutter extends the range of cut when you're cutting down grass. It's a cool detail that this exists at all, but it's not going to be replacing repels anytime soon. This is also the only overworld ability which affects an HM, which I guess within itself is a weird little oddity that's worth mentioning. And with that, we're done talking about Generation 3's HMs. Generation 3 had a lot of fun HMs, but we're at the point where we gotta use 8 of them if we want to explore the world to its fullest. This luckily wasn't a huge problem for Generation 3, but it was one for Generation 4! There's a lot of different things that Generation 4 is infamous for. Things like the surfing speed being really slow, Lissy's HP slowly scrolling down, and the amount of HMs you need to beat the game because there's a lot of them. But before I talk about why Generation 4 has a big HM issue, let's first talk about what HMs were added and which ones were changed or replaced. So just like Generation 3, we have 8 HMs. All of the staple HMs return except for Flash, which is now replaced with Defog. Flash Flash is still in the game as a TM, but you only ever use it in one area now, and that's it. And in this generation, Dive is replaced with Rock Climb. So, what do the two new HMs do anyways? Defog is basically Outdoor Flash. That's really it. Unlike Flash, I don't feel like you need Defog that badly, because you're not going to be blinded to the point where you can't see anything in a foggy area. Honestly, if you're going to be using Defog for anything, it's going to be to avoid getting into a battle with the foggy weather condition, which basically makes all of your attacks miss. It's really annoying. To be fair, if you have a Pokemon with Aura Spear or Swift in your party, the fog won't do anything to you because those moves 
will always hit. And that right there is how I avoided using Defog in my first playthrough of Pokemon Pearl version. And the other new HM is Rock Climb. It's basically the non-surf version of Waterfall. To use Rock Climb, you gotta go up to a wall that has a line of rocks on it. Then you gotta press the A button and you'll climb right up that line. Now we know what the new HMs do, you're probably wondering, where does Gen 4's HM problem come into play then? To give you a good idea of what I'm talking about, let's compare Generation 3's Victory Road to Generation 4's Victory Road. In Generation 3's Victory Road, you need to use Surf, Strength, Rock Smash, and Waterfall. Out of all of these, Rock Smash is probably the only HM out of all that you probably don't want to use in battle. Worst case scenario, you have a Pokemon that has both Waterfall and Surf on it, but that's not too bad. Compare it to Generation 4, which uses all those HMs and Rock Climb. Honestly, having that one extra HM doesn't seem like a lot at first, but it really does add up. Especially if you want to use Defog in Victory Road, because there are a few spots that are foggy in Victory Road Generation 4. On top of that, not a lot of Pokemon families can even learn Rock Climb. The Pokemon families that you can easily catch in Gen 4 that can actually learn this are Drapion, the Krogrug line, Bubarel, Machoke, and Machamp, the Garchomp line, Obama Snow, and I guess if you really raise that Lucario up, that can also learn it as well. Not even the box legendaries can learn rock climb, but that says a lot about your HM if the box legendaries can't learn it. They do make it so your fully evolved starter is guaranteed to learn rock climb, but at that rate, you might as well be turning your starter into an HM slave depending on what starter you picked. So the more reasonable option is to go with an HM slave so you don't have to worry about deleting and reteaching moves later. Generation 3 doesn't have this problem as much because it has its HM uses turned out a lot more. For example, they could have easily forced you to use Diamond Victory Road, but they don't. In fact, in Generation 3, there's never a time where you're going to need to use Dive and Waterfall at the same time. You only have to use one or the other depending on the situation. Most of the areas in Gen 4 don't have this luxury. In fact, in most of the areas in Gen 4, you're going to be required to use every ATM you've gotten beforehand. So honestly, it feels like the ATMs are forcing you to work around them when you're making your own move pools for your Pokemon. Plus, there's a lot more Pokemon in Generation 3 that can learn a variety of these ATMs. It does help in Gen 3's favor that three of those moves are water moves that most water Pokemon can learn. With that being said, I think Sinnoh is a really fun region to explore in Generation 4. I just wish it wasn't bogged down by the amount of HMs you need to explore said world. So the Waterfall HM actually works a little bit differently in this generation. I would not blame you if you didn't know that. In fact, they keep this little minor change in every other generation starting from this point onward. Now, if you want to go down a Waterfall, a Pokemon in your party must know the Waterfall HM. This does seem kind of weird at first until you consider the fact that if you can only go down a waterfall and not back up it, you can potentially get stuck there and the devs just want to prevent anything like that from happening. But that's all I have to say about the HMs in the Sinnoh games. No way I gotta talk about one more thing real quick because this is important. You cannot use cut outside of battle anymore. Yeah, I guess someone thought that was redundant and just took it out. And honestly, probably for the better? I'm not 100% sure. It was just a weird oddity. Alright, now we're gonna talk about Heart Gold, Soul Silver because they do have some of the same HMs as before, but some of them do work a little bit differently in Heart Gold Soul Silver in particular, which I feel like are worth mentioning. Funnily enough, Flash does not come back in the Gen 2 remakes. Instead, Whirlpool takes its spot. That also means that Defog is in the Gen 2 remakes as well. Whirlpool works slightly differently in the Gen 2 remakes. You no longer get rid of the Whirlpool, you actually just cross it now. Nothing too crazy, but I figure it's worth mentioning. Rock Climb is the Gen 2 remakes, weirdly enough, and it's the only time where an HM requires the 6 16th badge to work. Heart Gold Steel Silver adds one new mechanic to Rock Smash, which every game from this point onward would actually still use. And that is, when you use Rock Smash, instead of just fighting a Pokemon, now you have a chance of fighting a random item as well. The items vary depending on what game you're playing and what area you're in. You can find some pretty good items this way, that's also the only way you can get fossils in the Gen 2 remakes. And with that, I'm talking about all the HM related stuff about Generation 4. This was a generation where HM bloat was at its highest. With Generation 5 being a soft reboot to the series, it makes you wonder, are they going to solve this issue, or will it be more bloated than Gen 4 was? Well, time to find out. Alright, here's a trick question for anybody who's a Pokemon fan. How many HMs are required to beat the original Pokemon Black and White games? Here, I'll, I'll give you a second for this one, because it is a trick question. 
All right, you ready for the answer? Only one HM is required to beat the game, and that's cut once, and that's it. Isn't that insane how we went from Generation 4, which had all this HM bloat, to Generation 5, where you only need one HM to beat the whole game? And Black and White 2 requires you to use two HMs to beat the whole game. Now, don't get me wrong here. HMs still have their uses in this game, but they're not as heavily required as they were in Generation 4. In fact, they required so little to progress with the plot that Generation 5 is the only generation where you don't need a gym badge to use an HM. If you have a Pokemon that already has that HM on it, well congratulations, you can use that HM right now. I won't lie, it feels very illegal that I'm using Surf right now while only having one gym badge, but that's just how this game works I guess. So you're probably wondering how many HMs are actually in this game because you rarely use them at all. There are a total of 6 HMs in generation 5. All these HMs are returning HMs from the previous games. There are no new HMs in Generation 5. In fact, from this point onward, there are going to be no more new HM moves. Honestly, this is a really good idea in theory, but it does feel really jarring. One of the charms of the older Pokemon games that did have HMs is that the HMs basically gave you an idea of how you're gonna explore that region. This gave every region beforehand its own little bit of personality. So from Gen 5 onward, that little piece of personality is forever lost. This is not me saying that the regions from Gen 5 onward have no personality. In fact, I'd argue that the region in Gen 5 actually has a lot more personality than the regions before it. It's just that you'll never explore the region in a unique way like diving underwater in Hoenn or using Rock Climb in Sinnoh. And honestly, that really sucks, and it doesn't help that some of these HMs feel really dumbed down in Generation 5. The best example of this is the Strength HM. In all the previous generations, Strength was used to solve these block-pushing puzzles. Most of the time, these Strength puzzles require a little bit of thought, and you can't just brute force them. In Generation 5, there is no puzzle. You just push the block into the hole. And it's not like the boulder is going to be really far away either. It's usually right next to the hole. Honestly, it feels a little bit insulting that they simplify the block posting puzzles this much. It basically feels like that strength no longer interacts with the environment in any meaningful way, and now it's just a glorified shortcut opener. Dive also returns to Generation 5, but it feels dumbed down in its own different way. Let me start this off by saying I think it's really cool that at least in black and white, Dive is like a secret HM. There are no hints whatsoever that's in the game. Usually a lot of the other previous generations, when you get a gym badge, it will actually tell you what HM you can use with it. Since that isn't the thing in Generation 5, there's no hints that Dive is in the game at all, and the fact is you can only get and use dive in a post-game area. So because of this, it's really exciting to stumble upon the dive HM. I is until you realize that dive was only ever used once in the whole entire game. The area that Generation 5 lets you access is a really cool area for a lot of different reasons, and the puzzles there are really interesting. But dive isn't used in such a grand scale as it was in Generation 3, where in that game every ocean route has its own underwater version of that route. While Generation 5's use of dive is really simple and only in one area, you could argue that Generation 5 has more quality over quantity, because that one area where you use Dive in Generation 5 is a very small area, but it's very detailed and there's a lot of things going on in it, as opposed to a lot of the Dive spots in Generation 3 which could be seen as just connecting pathways. No matter how you see it though, at the end of the day, Generation 5's use of Dive is way more simple than the previous generation that used it. And that's how Generation 5 tackles the HM bloat problem by making it so you rarely use HMs at all. And when you do have to use HMs, it's really simplified, so you don't have to worry about swapping around your whole party too much, so you end up only worrying about HMs if you're exploring an hostile area as opposed to adjusting your whole moveset throughout the entire game. You can also see that in the fact that there's only 6 HMs this time around as opposed to Generations 3 and 4 which had up to 8. The only HMs that are in Generation 5 are Hut, Fly, Search, Strike, Waterfall, and Dive. They could have easily brought back Rock Smash, but I kind of like that they chose not to. They really wanted you to not be bloated down with HMs throughout the whole game, and I respect that a lot, but that came with the cost of no new HMs and the HMs that are returning are used in very simple ways. It must make you wonder then how Generation 6 is going to tackle all this. Are there going to be more or less HMs? Are the HMs going to be simplified or not? Or are they even going to be required to beat the game? So it's time for us to look at Generation 6 and find out. It's gonna feel weird saying this, but Generation 6 has the least amount of HMs since Generation 1. Yep, that's right, we're back to only having 5 HMs again, which is something I never thought I'd see. The 5 HMs that are still around are Cut, Fly, Surf, Strength, and Waterfall. Rock Smash is actually back in this game as a usable TM outside of battle, unlike Generation 5, but it's totally optional this time around to not even an HM. I do think it's kinda neat that Rock Smash now can break down walls though, but nothing else really new is added to it in X and Y. 
With X and Y in particular, you can really start to see them lean away towards HMs. You can see this very clearly in one feature that Pokemon X and Y would add. In fact, they would build upon this more in Sun and Moon, and that would be Ride Pokemon. I want to make this very clear. The Ride Pokemon and Pokemon X and Y are not deep. There are only three Ride Pokemon in the whole game, and two of them just hit you to point A to point B. They both feel really obnoxious to control, and they're both there to be there, if anything at all. But most people People think of the ride Pokemon from Pokemon X and Y, they're probably thinking about Skiddo. Skiddo has a big gimmick that people hyped up on release, but then an execution that's really underwhelming, and that is Skiddo can actually jump up the ledges. It's really funny because while you're riding Skiddo, you can't get into a trainer battle, which you can use to avoid one trainer in particular. But sadly, you cannot take Skiddo off this route and jump up whatever legs you please. Besides Skiddo, I can easily see them making the other two ride Pokemon at one point HMs, but deciding not to. Like, I cannot emphasize that enough. They could have easily an HM that lets you cross through Rocky Train or Snowy Train, or maybe even both. But instead, they decided to make ride Pokemon to avoid that HM blow that previous generations had. Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if they did this first and foremost to give this region a little bit of world building. I still believe more that ride Pokemon were their answers towards HM bloat though because the first time you surf in the route, you'll get a free Lapras. And if you surf with that Lapras, you can see it has this own unique model. That in particular makes me wonder if that at one point this was a ride Pokemon instead. But knowing my luck, it's most likely just a Generation 2 reference that I'm overthinking it. Especially because the Gen 3 remakes do something kind of similar. If you surf with Wilbur, Sarkido, or Kyogre, you can actually see your player character right on top of them. This also includes when you dive underwater, and that's actually the only way you can swap between the three Pokemon if you really wanted to. Kyogre doesn't do anything particular, it's just there for aesthetics. Sarkido is the fastest Pokemon you surf with, so if you choose to surf with Sarkido, you'll actually have double the movement speed while you're surfing, but on the flip side, you can't use any fishing rods. The game justifies the saying if you actually try to use a fishing rod on top of a Sarkido that you'll fall off, but I don't think so if you're just stationary like that. I mean, that's just me though, I mean, I don't make the rules. And with Welmer, you can crash the game! Well, you used to be able to crash the game. I actually couldn't replicate this instance myself because they actually patched it out. Oh yeah, since we're talking about the home game surfing stuff, let's actually talk about, you know, the Gen 3 remakes because that's kind of important. I won't lie, it's a little bit jarring going from X and Y, which only had five HMs to the Gen 3 remakes, which have actually seven of them. Yeah, seven, not eight, because Black still isn't an HM. They never brought that back as an HM. Rock's the best of the Gen 3 remakes is a required HM, unlike an X and Y, where it was just an optional TM, and you can actually miss because I missed it on my playthrough of Y. It still kind of sucks though because even though that strength is required, the strength puzzles have still been dumbed down. This was the hardest strength puzzle in Ruby and Sapphire and you can see it's basically on rails in Omega Ruby Alpha Sapphire. But at least it's more than just a shortcut opener like it is in X and Y. Dive got one weird change and that's the fact that now when you use Dive, you can actually find trainers underwater. I get it, there'd be other people diving down here looking for Pokemon and whatnot, but it does feel kind of weird to go from Gen 3 with there's no trainers down here, to the remakes, which actually does have trainers down here. Now at Fly, you can fly to any route in the game, not just towns and cities. Honestly, a really nice quality of life that I wish was in more of the games. Funny I mentioned that about Fly, because it actually does kind of get a replacement in this game. This really is the first ride Pokemon, and that's your Latios or Latias that you get with the Eon Flute. With the Eon Flute, you can basically fly to any town in the game. To be fair, fly is still instantaneous, unlike the Eon Flute. So if you just really want to get somewhere really that fast, fly is better. But if you don't want to have to fly each hit with you all the time, which honestly, fly isn't a good move, so I don't blame you. The Eon Flute is a really good replacement for fly. It also just feels really fun to fly around the Hoenn region like this. You basically fly on top of your Latios or Latias like it's a Final Fantasy airship. It really feels like the airship from Final Fantasy VI. It's kind of cool. And just like a Final Fantasy airship, you have to manually pilot over to where you want to land, whether that be a town or a route. It feels really refreshing to fly about the region like this. In fact, I've never seen that Pokemon game do this before. You can get a lot of cool views this way too. Yeah, I know it's a 3DS game, so the visuals aren't that impressive, but I still think this is really cool and I've never seen the Hoenn region this way before. You can encounter some wild 
Pokemon while you're flying with the Yon Flute, but it's actually pretty rare, honestly. You have to go really out of your way to bump into them in my experience. Every day there are different islands that can spawn while you're flying with the Eon Flute that you can land onto. Some of these islands have Pokemon that aren't native to the Hoenn region, some of them have legendaries, it all depends on what island you find. Overall, I really like the Eon Flute, probably the best thing in the ORS remix in my opinion. X and Y didn't do a lot with its HMs, as a matter of fact, they tried to really shy away from them. The Gen 3 remakes had HMs just to have them because the original games did as well, so it wouldn't feel authentic if they got rid of them. But at any chance they got, it made sure that the HM use was very minimal and also very quick, so you're not using them for long. So as soon as you can, you can delete them for better moves. And you can see where they're going with this because Sudden Moon has no more HMs, they got rid of them for Ride Pokemon. Every Ride Pokemon basically replaces an essential HM. So Sword and Shield also do this with the bike, but it's not an actual Pokemon this time around, it's just an item. But the idea is still the same, where this is replacing any kind of HM uses, so you're not wasting boom slots on HM moves. And that is every HM move from Generations 1 through 6. But as a little bonus, let's talk about every move you can use outside of battle that's 9 HM moves. Sweet Set can be used outside of battle to get into a random encounter with a wild Pokemon. It's really handy if you just want to get into a ton of random encounters without having to walk around in the grass for a while. Sweet Set also has an item equivalent, which is the honey jars. In Generation 6, they changed Sweet Set a little bit, and now when you use it, you always will get into a horde battle, not just any kind of random encounter. It's really nice because it guarantees a horde battle, which is normally kind of rare. There's also a really weird glitch in Diamond and Pearl where if you use Sweet Set or a honey jar instead of a Pokemon, it really fucks up the menus. They still work like normal, it's just you can't see the text of what you're buying, which is kind of funny. D can be used outside of battle to get out of any dungeon or any area like that. It's basically just an escape rope. Teleport will teleport you back to the last Pokemon Center you stayed at. Some games will tell you which Pokemon Center that is, and other ones won't, and I guess it's just a blind leap of fate at that rate. Honestly, you only really use Teleport if you don't have the gym pads to use Fly yet, or if you're doing some Pokemon speedruns. Milk Drink and Softwell do the same exact thing. They take away HP from the Pokemon that's using that move to heal another Pokemon in your party. In the Johto games, Headbutt can be used outside of battle. To use Headbutt, you have to interact with a tree, and occasionally if you Headbutt a tree, a Pokemon will come out, and that's all Headbutt does. In the Hoenn games, Secret Power can be used outside of battle in certain places to make secret bases. Honestly, there's a lot to say about secret bases, so I'll just probably make another video about them in the future. And finally, the last move we're going to be talking about, Chatter. Chatter outside of battle lets you use the DS's microphone to change how to cry to whatever you want it to be. This will also change how Chatter sounds. Changing Chatter's cry with Chatter only does one thing, and that one thing is that if you Chatter in battle, the louder of a noise you made, the higher of a chance it will cause confusion. So to get the most out of this move, I guess you're gonna obnoxiously scream into your DS's microphone, which I guess is something you can do, and not just every Pokemon move you can use outside of battle. I won't lie, to some degree I will miss using HM moves because you're using your own Pokemon to interact with the environment. And then I have flashbacks using Rock Smash in late game areas, and actually I'm, I'm good, I'm good. So I prefer the ride Pokemon in the long run, so I'm not teaching my Pokemon really bad moves here at the end of the game because I need to progress with the plot. So I think this is a change for the better. Oh yeah, did I make this video? I kind of realized something really embarrassing. <laughs> that is that the reason why there's only like eight HMs max in a generation, if there is eight HMs, is because there's only eight gym badges. I don't know why I ever thought about this until now, but um, yeah. Okay, that's all I got. Bye! Holy shit, it's finally fucking over. Uh, this video took a long time to make because I didn't realize how much I actually had to say about this topic until I started to do it. Plus, there was stuff I had to research about this video while I was doing it. Not a lot, but there were some instances where I'm like, oh my god, I need to confirm this or I need to check this or whatever. So if you've gotten this far, thank you so much. This is probably one of my longer videos, which I didn't think it was going to be this long, but here we are. Honestly, I don't really have a lot to say for this video in particular. If you want to support me, be the thumbs up, leave a comment, subscribe. Do all that shit. If you want to go be up and beyond, I have a Patreon somewhere. Maybe it's in the link of the video. I don't remember at the moment. I'm fucking tired. <laughs> this video. Oh my god. There were so many takes I had to do for most of these lines. It was kind of insane. I had a lot of fun doing this video, but god damn, I had to do so many takes for a lot of these lines because they sound like shit. <laughs> But it was a cool video though. I'm gonna be so excited when I finally have this edited, you know, out there. I mean, by the time that's the case, you, you'll, you'll be hearing this and whatnot. But for me right now, I still gotta actually like, you know, do the final edits and whatnot. I don't know how much longer that'll be, but 
it will be something, I guess. So yeah, thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next one. I don't know what that's going to be. Uh, we're, we're figuring this out as I go. Bye!